Good evening and welcome. I just got to get this microphone on, so excuse me while I do that. It's a joy to again be with you, to share the Word of God, and let me say welcome to everybody that is new. Um, I, I found that out through many sources that we're getting a number of new people here every Tuesday and so welcome to every one of you and just relax and let the Holy Spirit make the Word of God come alive to you and thank you for all those of you that have donated uh, not only to the trees but also to this this program which we pay for and offer it free to the world literally and tonight we have reason to believe there are people watching us down in Indonesia and in the islands of the Pacific and it's it's paid for by those of you that have donated and um, thank you thank you thank you for enabling us to share the Word of God with so many Okay, I want to look tonight, and we're still doing what we've been doing for the last number of weeks. Um, and the question that we started off with was, uh, who are you? And we're still in that, that theme and idea. But tonight it's in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. And that last phrase, forget none of his benefits, is what I'm focusing in on tonight, as well as the entire um, of those two verses. It's an unusual psalm in those two verses. D did you notice he's talking to himself? Bless the Lord, O my soul. And so David is the writer, but he's also in his writing talking to himself. Did you get that? Bless the Lord, O my soul. He's not commanding a vast audience of people to do that. He's looking within himself and he's saying to his soul, bless the Lord and then he expands on that to all that is within me as if to say from the top of my head to the toes of my feet to my mind my imagination my emotions the totality of my senses bless the Lord bless his holy name and forget none of his benefits well, what's he doing He's taking charge of his soul, his entire inner being. Now hear that, we're not used to that. He's taking charge, he's taking ownership over his mind and his emotions, he's taking ownership over his senses and in that he's turning the attention of his whole body to Bless the Lord. Now, I say this may seem a strange idea to some of you, but, but let it sink in. I say taking ownership. M many times our minds and the continual revolution of thoughts within our minds, they, they take over and they control us, especially when we're anxious. Anxiety is simply that you, you're thinking all the thoughts that go crazy in your head have taken over and they actually make your body feel weak. Sometimes they make you break in a cold sweat. Good grief, your mind has taken over your whole person. Other times your emotions and, and you, you're a basket case. Um, you're hysterical, whatever. But what, Paul, uh, what David is saying to all of him, he says, I'm in charge here. There's an I here, my, my very central self, I, 
I, in covenant with this glorious Lord, take ownership of my entire person, and I say, turn your whole attention to Him and bless the Lord. Be focused upon Him without any distraction. And whatever the moment is that we're going through, whatever the happening is, we thus take ownership of the moment. So we're not being kicked around by circumstances, we're not being crushed by the situation, nor are we being taken over by our mind and our emotions or the reports of our five senses. We've taken charge. And, and I'll say this doesn't happen by default. It doesn't just happen that you, you suddenly find yourself in control. And that's why you will find other expressions in the scripture which are saying the same thing. And it's a command that, that is to get with it, get, get your whole being focused. And so you see the expression, turn to the Lord. What does that mean? Basically the same thing. Get a hold of yourself and you, the central self, you who is in charge of your whole being, body, mind, emotions, your, your, your invisible person within your body, turn to the Lord, you see, it's the same idea, or uh, um, that other one that we looked at a little bit last week, where, where it, it, it tells us to look to the Lord, or behold your God, it, it's, it's a command to our very selves, don't, don't be distracted over here, distracted over there, turn your whole attention. And it's in the form of a command to do it. And David is issuing the command because unless we recognize that we are the ones who must take ownership in our union with the Lord, we take ownership of our entire being and issue the command because without the command, we're liable not to do this. That, that sort of being kind and liable, we're not going to do this. You see, look at yourself just for a second before we get into this. The flesh, this, this center of mortality, this stuff, this flesh, and all the five senses, my eyes and my ears and my smell and my taste and my touch, or the, every way in which what is happening is reported to me, the, the flesh bullies me. It's a bully. And, and, and it, it tells me that what my five senses are reporting, that's it. That's all there is to life. That's it. And, and if we yield to the bully, then we shall live life by our senses. We'll live life by what appears to be the truth rather than by the unchanging truth, which is not always visible. Most of the time it's not visible. We forget all his benefits, we forget the truth, and we become the person who merely lives by responding to whatever is happening around us. And so we're happy if things are going as we would perceive our way, and we're very unhappy if we perceive things are not going our way. And, and, and so we, we live on this roller coaster of responses. What David is saying, he'd get a grip. He turns to his soul and he says, I'm in charge here. I take my ownership, which is mine to take, and I command you to bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. And of course at other times um, we're, we're, we're drifting, nothing much is happening and so we just drift. And if you notice, uh, again the mind takes over uh, and our mind just drifts here and drifts there and, uh, and uh, here we go. And sometimes we're, we're off in some never-never land because we're We've yielded the ownership of our very person to our soul, the, the inner, inner person that we are. So that's what this is about. And that's why I say it's an unusual psalm, because most psalms are directed to the Lord 
or they are David telling the Lord how he feels and then bringing himself into line of faith and trust. But this one, he begins by talking to his body, his soul, and, and, and commanding, bless the Lord. What does that mean? Well, the word bless, so often used of the Lord blessing us, but in this case, and a number of other cases, we are told to bless the Lord. What does it mean? Well, the word bless literally means, in the original language that David wrote in, it means to speak a good word. And so when we bless the Lord, it's equal to praising Him. It means I shall find every good that has been revealed to me concerning the Lord. I shall find every good that he has done in my life, and I shall speak those words, good words, words of good report. And I shall praise him and acknowledge that he is the source of every good thing in my life. So he's commanding his soul to give praise to God. Ah, but it's connected here, and forget not all his benefits. <clears throat> and that's what, what gets a hold of me, and if you've watched any previous um, last three or four weeks, you, you'll, I hope you'll begin to get this. If you haven't, by the way, this stands on its own two legs. Um, forget not. Now... This may, for some of you, be a repetition, but I don't apologize because we have got to understand what this word forget means and the sister word remember because they are in some way or another scattered through the scripture and they do not mean quite what they mean in English because the people of the Bible, when they forgot when they use the word forget, most of the time they didn't use it quite as we do. It amounts to the same thing, sort of, but they, they, let, let me say what they meant. Number one, what they didn't mean was amnesia. You know, when, when you, you totally, I'm using it as the Western world word now, I forgot. I mean, it just left my mind. I forgot. Now, that, that's not what this is talking about. No. no. Nor does it mean that I've had a mental lapse. You know, that, that fog that suddenly comes over the brain. And, and, and you forget the most obvious thing. And I, I, I forgot. No, that's not what this is talking about. Um, I mean, that, that sort of meaning is sometimes in scripture and it's pretty obvious when it is but I, essentially the word forget listen carefully is to leave something in the past where and when it was said or where and when the event happened so you said something to me or some situation occurred and to forget it biblically is not for it to leave your mind it is rather for you to leave it back there in history where it happened when it happened time on the clock date on the calendar and you leave it there and that's where it is and you acknowledge it happened it was said it was done you do not bring it into the present moment. That is, you do not let whatever was said or whatever was done, you do not let it have authority and control and to make your life bend according to whatever it was that was said, whatever happened. No, you leave it there. It's got no effect upon me in the present moment. That 
past event or those past words do not connect with me in this present situation. It happened, I know it, but it has nothing to do with now. I've shelved it in my library of history there in the back of my brain. And so in the scripture, for most of the time, the word forget means to be disconnected from the past in whatever happened. Therefore, I am not living now in an energy that has come to me from the past. So, I guess I hear something was said, maybe it was a hurtful thing. Well, whatever it was has no power over me today. It, it, there's no energy released into today that has its origin in something that was said or happened in the past. It, it's not allowed to order my present life situation. Now, we, we have, especially here in the West, we have, and I use the word again, vast libraries of information within our brain cells. And quite frankly, they have no effect upon our life whatsoever. Come on, you, you, you know that. Uh, some have degrees in knowledge that as soon as they got the degree, then all that knowledge that cost all that money is simply shelved. It's not going to have any effect upon them in the future. No bearing on present life situations. We merely know about it, but there it is. We know about it. It does not affect the way I live today, does not affect the way I look at myself or look at you or look at tomorrow. It just, it's there. No effect. No energy in the present moment coming from that piece of know about. And especially is this true in matters of the gospel. And that, that's where David is, is centering. It, it's, it's so possible, and I'm speaking to those of you that are listening to me tonight, um, and I, I speak as a brother in Christ. I speak, we're in the same boat together, that it is the easiest thing in the world for us to know the gospel and then turn it into a forget mode. Now, you should understand by now, I don't mean we've got a mental blank and we can't remember it as we use that word in the West. I mean, we, in fact, we do know we do know the facts of the gospel. We know the promises of the gospel. And once upon a time, it was a living thing to us, but we forgot. That is, it no longer has any power, any energy, any authority in our lives today. We live as if it wasn't even there. And so we've forgotten. Um, we, we, that is, we do not bring our lives under the authority of those words or events that make up our lives, or in this specific case, make up the gospel. We, we act as if it happened with no connection to the rest of history. And so, in such a case, we'll look back upon the promises uh, of the scripture. We'll look back upon the death, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We'll, we'll look back upon his ascension to the right hand of the Father. We look back to the giving of the Holy Spirit as if that has no connection to this present micro moment in which our hearts are beating. This throbbing moment of you looking at me and me looking at you in this second. We look as if that just happened somewhere in the past. Do you remember the first text we used when we were asking this question, who we are? Let me briefly go back to it because it's, this is what it's talking about. 
James chapter 1 and verse 21. He says, In humility receive, hear these words, in humility receive the word implanted. That word receive, in this case, means to accept something very deliberately and readily. You take action, and you do so with intention, and, and, and you do so with readiness, uh, suggesting a sort of excitement. I tell you, when the, this very same word was used, do you remember old Simeon who had waited all his very long life long because he had been promised that he would see the Messiah, the Savior? And you remember the Virgin Mary and, and Joseph come into the temple and she's holding that little newborn Jesus. And, and as she comes through the milling crowd, old Simeon comes over and he offers his hands and she hands him the child for blessing and he grasps the child and I'm sure with tears streaming down his face he said, mine eyes have seen your salvation. Well, the word that is used there for his receiving Jesus from Mary is this same word. And so I say again, it means, yeah, I, I take with, with intention, deliberately, with excitement, I, I grasp to myself. So he says, thus, in that fashion, receive the Word, the Word of God, the Word of Scripture, the Word of His promises, that are summed up in Jesus, the final Word of God, for He is God from God. He said, receive it, implant it, take it, and let it be implanted within you, which is able, he said, to save your souls. And now it's here. So here it is. But prove yourselves doers, doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. He said, if you just hear what it says, if you just hear it, I, I, you're in delusion, man. You just heard it and it's gone in one ear, out the other. You know it was said. You, you know it was history, but you didn't do it. He said, prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. He goes on, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. He said That's, uh, that person is like one who hears it but doesn't do it. And if you don't do it, biblically, you've forgotten it. It has no effect on you. It might as well not have been said. It's not changing your life, your conversation. It doesn't change your relationship with the Lord or relationship with others. It just, you heard it, that's it. He says, you've forgotten. You've forgotten the kind of person the Lord says you are in Christ Jesus. But he says, one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, that is, lives his life according to it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This man shall be blessed in what he does. I, I, I don't think I need to comment. He is equating forgetting with having heard the Word of God, known it coming into you, and then not doing anything with it. And, and when we speak of doing it, let me say what I didn't say the other week, and Claude so properly reminded me. When I say do, many times we cannot do the whole thing the first time. We take baby steps, sometimes fall flat on our face. But 
we know that in the Word of God is the power to do the Word of God and so we get up off our fall and know that uh, this word of God in the power of the Spirit can and shall be done and so we take our baby steps and in taking the baby steps we find strength to do more and then strength to do more and that's the way it is one other thing about this uh, because it is so appropriate for the day in which we live Ezekiel that there's a passage in Ezekiel that is long arrested me he he poured out his hearts he was one of the prisoners of war along with the rest of Jerusalem that had been taken captive with him and, and they all lived in the same area and he would stand on street corners sit in his house and pour out his heart with the words that God gave him and that they came the people came and they applauded they were entertained by his words and the Lord says Ezekiel do you know what's going on here he said in chapter 33 of Ezekiel <clears throat> verse 30 he says but as for you son of man your fellow citizens who talk about you by the walls and in the doorways of houses he said everybody's talking about you in uh, they're speaking to one another each to his brother saying come now hear what the message is which comes forth from the Lord they said you should hear this chap he's a jolly good speaker Let, let's go and hear what the Lord has said to him today and off they went to listen to Ezekiel and they come says the Lord they come to you as people come and, and they sit before you and they sit before you as my people and they hear your words but they do not do them you see he says in fact behold they you are to them like a sensual song by one who has a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument for they hear your words but they do not practice them you see what he's saying he said, they love to hear you. They're entertained. They say he's better than the other prophet, isn't he? Better than that other chap who came through. We like this one. Let's go and hear him again. And they came and they heard and they said, boy, he's better tonight than he was last night, isn't he? But the idea of actually taking those words and doing them no, they didn't see it like that. It was just they were doing the right thing. Isn't this thing uh, of going to listen to the prophet, isn't that what the people of the Lord do? And so, because they were of religious bent, then uh, listening to this proclaimer of truth was entertainment to them. And they, they say, it's the same as going to a pop concert. He said to, to them, you're like a sensual song, someone with a beautiful voice, and they play an instrument. You know, in the message, paraphrase, he really gets it. Uh, let me read this same passage from the message. He said, as for you, son of man, you've become quite the talk of the town. Your people meet on street corners and in front of their houses and say, let's go and hear the latest news from God. They show up, as people tend to do, and sit in your company. They listen to you speak, but they don't do a thing you say. They flatter you with compliments, but all they care about is making money and getting ahead. To them, you are merely entertainment, a country singer of sad love songs playing a guitar. They love to hear you talk, but nothing comes of it. You see what I'm saying they'd forgotten I mean they could quote you what Ezekiel said they they could come there and describe themselves as indeed the people of God but they forgot in that they didn't take that word and translate it immediately into some sort of positive response and do it now contrast those two verses that I've just been referring to with Joshua. 
the Lord said to Joshua in chapter 1 of his book in verse 5, Be strong, courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that, so that, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have success. An interesting thing there. He says, be strong and very courageous and careful to do. So sometimes you say, I need God-given strength and courage to do the Word of God. I need the Holy Spirit giving to me the strength and the courage to put into daily practice all the promises of this incredible good news. But he says it's as you do it, you meditate and you do this is This is not forgetting. See, are you getting this that forgetting is nothing to do with your brain where you have a fog and you forget it's not forgetting is hearing something and not doing it into practice it's hearing something and not adjusting your behavior accordingly so it's hearing that Jesus said, be anxious for nothing. Your heavenly Father knows all these things. He'll make sure they'll be added to you. Or casting all your care upon Him, for He cares. He loves you. Hearing that and going straight from that to worry and lose a night's sleep as to what shall we eat and what shall we drink and how shall we have a roof over our heads. Hold it, did you ever read that? that? That's what it's saying, you see, because it's fresh in your mind, but you've forgotten it in the sense you don't do anything, you make no response, you don't put it into practice. You do not allow the Holy Spirit energy which is in those words to invade the life in order to here and now direct life to bring about all that he has promised. Forget not. Forget not. Well, that's a bit awkward, isn't it? Forget not. I mean, it's old English and it still comes over into our Bible translations for a good reason. Forget not is a negative way of saying remember. I mean, if I, if I say remember, well, I could always say instead forget not. Or really modern English, don't forget. And... and there's a reason for it being here. Have, did you hear it even in, as I just said it, to say forget not or don't forget really underscores it. If I just say remember, that's one thing, but forget not, that's as if I underline it in red, don't forget. And, and so we're really speaking here of remember. Well, what is remember? Remember in the scripture does not mean thinking, 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 trying to bring something from the deep past into my mind and imagination. The word remember in the Bible means to bring a past event or a past word into the present moment by doing it again and by bringing life under the authority of that past word or event and in that way releasing its power into this present moment so that 
if I look at scripture merely historically, well, it's 2,000 years since the, the last was written, more or less. And, and, and Jesus died back there 2,000 years and so on. But biblically, to remember is to bring that reality into your life now as you sit in your living room or your office or wherever you are. And in this moment, that is as alive now as it was then. How do I discover that aliveness? By doing it, by acting as if indeed it is true. And as I do, the energy of the Holy Spirit is released into my life. That's remember. And you see the connection there with forget. You see, it places it in the negative because well, our flesh, our mortality, you know, we're a bit twisted, we're bent, we do daft things. And, and it, it, we are experts, every one of us, we're experts in forgetting what we should remember. That is, we leave in the past, as if it's mere history, what we should now be responding to by doing an action in the present moment. We're experts at forgetting what we should be remembering, and we're experts in remembering what we should forget. We're experts at bringing stuff from the past, which has no business in this present moment, has no business in putting energy into my life that doesn't belong here. I should forget it. I should acknowledge it happened, but it's got no place here. I, I, I could spend a, 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 an entire hour on that, and maybe we will one of these days, but just to reference it, have you noticed, and we're all together in this, have you noticed how we remember hurts? I mean, what she said to you what he said to you, what was it, 20 years ago, 40 years ago? Yet you can almost repeat the conversation. You can still feel the acid rise in your stomach. You can still feel the emotions of pain and rejection. And then you can feel the bitterness and the anger. Good grief. That happened so long ago, but you remember it. You see, you bring it into the present, and you are ordering your life by that bitterness, that energy of hurt. You, you, you went through a divorce. You went through a bankruptcy. You, you went through some collapse of, of a relationship, whatever, and... and you still name yourself by it. You, you, you still say that you're the loser who failed in relationship. I'm the loser out of bankruptcy. It belongs in the past, you see. But we remember it into the present and we order our life under the shadow of that. But you see, isn't it amazing? And so many of us, we, we look at ourselves as if Jesus never came. We, we know he did. We've confessed him as Lord. But we look at ourselves as if he never rose from the dead. We look at ourselves as if he never ascended to send the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. So that through the Holy Spirit, Jesus himself dwells within us and the Father and we're drawn into the fellowship of the Trinity, we live as if that's fantasy. Or we've forgotten. Instead of remembering that into our lives every day to go and act as if it is so, to discover in the face of Jesus that God is love and the foundation of what God calls life is love, and then to do it and go and love as he has loved us. 
And if this is a command, which it is, bless the Lord, O my soul. That's a command. It's imperative. Do it. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name and forget not all his benefits. Command, command is imperative. Well, what does that tell you? If it's a command, it demands a choice. And so, you see, with the biblical meaning of these words, forgetting doesn't just happen to you. You know, it's not I'm getting old, I, I, I'm forgetful. No, 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 that's a Western way of saying it. In the Eastern book, the Bible, the word forget means I make a choice. Maybe the first time I make it, it's a pretty big one, but it gets easier and easier and easier. And the choice is, I'll deal with that later. And later becomes a long distance. Um, we choose. We choose to forget. And we certainly choose to remember. As we just saw in James chapter 1, he said, you receive. And that, that means you, with, with deliberation, you take that which is offered to you. It's it's a choice. Now, that that's kind of a new idea here in the West. Uh, but you see, it is choice. It is choice. Uh, you see, my my flesh, my flesh is a complainer, a whiner. My flesh talks with a nasal twang. Horrible. I always know the voice of the flesh. I'm a victim. Oh, poor me, poor me. I'm a victim of my circumstances. If she hadn't done that, if he hadn't done that, if I had had better breaks in life, blah, blah, that's my flesh. Rotten, stinking, corrupt flesh. Always the victim. Or, of course, the flip side is always the proud that exalts itself above others. Um, and, but... I can't help the way things are, you see. Well, this scripture denies you that. You're not a victim. Not in Christ Jesus, you're not a victim. This command says, take ownership of your life. You are in Christ. Christ is in you. Take authority. Confront that flesh and declare that it was crucified with Christ. Confront those senses, those five senses that tell you what you see, what you see, what you hear. Now, that's as good as it gets. No, it isn't. There's a, there's a greater truth. What you're reporting may be true right now, but there's a greater truth. A truth that is eternal. A truth that never changes. Forget not. It, it means that every mighty act of God from Genesis on, how can I put this? How do we know who God is? Well, we know God by his mighty actions. Nowhere in the scripture does he merely sit down and lecture us about who he is. He does stuff. And, and in what he does, in his mighty actions, we discover who he is. Uh, so, how, let me give you an example. We, we know who God is by the plagues of Egypt. We know that he's the God who cares for the downtrodden. He's the God who cares for those that are in oppression and slavery, and he delivers them. By the Red Sea, we know that nothing is impossible to this God. Now, that didn't come in lecture form. It came in actions that he did. And as you go on through the scripture, uh, how do we know the heart of God? Because the heart of God came, Jesus. And how do we know who he is? He took us to himself, and he died, and he rose, and he ascended. How do we know God today? Because he gave us, he did. He gave us the Holy Spirit. You see, we know God in his actions. And so forget not, or to remember, is to remember his mighty actions in Jesus. And 
every other promise that flows from other revelations of himself that are all subordinate to that one in Jesus. Remember, that is bring it into your life today. Connect with that, who he is, in the light of what he's done, and appropriate it. If this is who he is, if this is the God he's revealed himself to be, then, and so on. Um, it, it affects the way I think about myself in relation to loving, and love behavior, uh, how I think of myself in terms of wholeness, the healing of body, how I look at others, how I look at the cares of this life, how I look at the oppressors of this life, how I look at things when it appears the loss of all things. I don't react to any of that. Rather, I remember who he is, which means I receive him into this situation to be who he is. There's an interesting little story in Mark chapter 8. It begins in verse 14. Uh, and um, the, the story, without reading the whole thing, is that they get into the boat to cross Galilee, the disciples and Jesus, and they're going to cross the Lake Galilee, which is a very small lake as lakes go. And, and so it didn't take very long to get across, but they'd omitted to bring any food with them. They didn't have any bread. And, and they get all um, upset among themselves, and they're, they're, they're whispering, and says, hey, who was it that was supposed to bring the bread? Good grief, you well, 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 couldn't you think to bring the bread? And they're, they're all, we haven't got any bread. And so Jesus said to them, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? <laughs> this is just a little trip across the lake. Why, why are you so full of anxiety that we have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? That's quite a statement. Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? Do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces you picked up? And they said 12. And when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said, seven. And he was saying to them, don't you yet understand? Did you, do you hear what he's saying? Here these disciples were present on two separate occasions. The one that we're very familiar with when he fed the 5,000 men and women and children, so about 15,000 people. And then on the other occasion, um, when there were 4,000, and he says, you were there. You, you saw how from five loaves and two fishes I fed the multitude and you were part of that miracle. You fed the people. You fed the people on both occasions. And they stand there saying, yeah, yeah. He said, don't you understand? Is your hard heart rather is your heart hard have you forgotten have you not remembered what is Jesus saying he is saying that the feeding of the multitude that is a great act of God in Jesus the multiplication of bread and fish to feed a multitude he said don't, don't you realize what was happening? And, and their response, at least by their actions, is, well, yeah, but that was then. I mean, that was a few weeks ago, maybe months. That was then. This is now. 
We're on the boat now, and we don't have anything to eat. Jesus said, have you forgotten? Forgotten what? That in both those cases, Jesus is displaying the care of the Father for his children in terms of bread and fishes. That he would, if necessary, work a miracle of multiplication in order to feed them. He says, you don't have to worry. Yeah, but that was when there were the 5,000. That was when there were the 4,000. I mean, that was then. No, no, no. Don't you remember that is? Can't you bring that revelation of God into this boat? Can't you live with that every day from here on out? That didn't stand by itself. That's not now to be looked back in history as something sort of monumental that he fed the 5,000. No, that reality that he cares for you, he's concerned about what you eat, he's concerned about the stuff that makes up daily life. Okay, you got that? Then remember it and remember it and remember it. And when it looks as if you have no food, you turn through Jesus to the Father. And when it looks as if what you call natural life is collapsing around you, remember, you say, remember, bring those events into the present moment. And he who fed the 5,000, believe me, will feed you. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. And, and that's um, true all the way through the scripture. Um, it's, it's really what he says in Romans 10 and, and verse 6. Have you ever read this? I'm sure you have read part of it anyway. He says, but the righteousness based on faith speaks thus. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend to heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend to the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. What does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. What's he saying? He says, you don't have to go searching the universe. Shall we go to heaven and try and find the answer? Shall, shall we descend into the depths to find? No, he said, the resurrection of Jesus is not somewhere off there in outer space. It's not lost in time, it, it happened in time while the clock was ticking, but it transcends time. Its energy, its reality is right here and now. And so he uses the expression, believe in your heart. That is not accept it with your head. It's not something just for your intellect. It's not merely academic with your heart, which is what faith is all about. It's an act of remembering it is. In this moment, Jesus Christ is alive. Then I shall act in the light of that and declare to the Father with my mouth, if he is alive, which I believe in my heart, then you receive me as your child. You see what I mean? You, you bring it into the present to respond with action, with do it, with do it. That's how we define ourselves as believers. We define ourselves by the Word of God, which found its focus in Jesus and does find its focus in Jesus. And that's how we define ourselves. Not, not by laws and formulas, but the reality that everything God has said and all that he is in Jesus, all that he is in the Holy Spirit is now. 
And so I take it, thank you. I receive it, thank you. And I go now to put that into practice, even though it be with stumbling little steps, but I'm acting. I will not forget this. I'm going to remember it by doing it. So what does it mean? I'll put it this way. I meet people all the time. And they say they're going to read through the Bible in a year. Whoopee! You know, read through the Bible in a year. I'm not saying there isn't a place for that. Um, but don't, don't think that that's going to be your spiritual nourishment. Um, sometimes your Bible reading program gives you a passage and there's so much there. The best you can say is, well, I did my daily reading. What, I, what I'm saying is when the Holy Spirit makes a part of Scripture, some flashing diamond facet of, of Jesus makes that real to you, hold it. And don't leave it until you have translated that into action. Do it. And I can report to you sometimes that takes me a week, just being with one portion of Scripture and, and praying with that passage and then to apply it to life and, and then to pray it and apply it to life. Uh, there are some passages of Scripture now I've been with for a couple of years and, and I ever return to them. Um, one of these days there'll be a seminar on a passage of scripture and I don't know how long you think it takes me to prepare it's as long as it takes for me to translate that into life and then report to you um, for, forget about reading through the Bible unless you just enjoy that as uh, you just like to know what's there I, I mean, I've memorized the entire Bible, and, and so, um, yeah, there's a place for it. But, but don't think that that is, is your nourishment, is your life, until you're doing it. Until you look into the Scripture and you see in the face of Jesus, this is who I am. This is what He has made me. This is who He is in me and who I am in Him. And you begin to put that into practice. And as you begin to put it into practice, you are in the condition, the state of remembering. And as you remember, the Holy Spirit strengthens you and you become established in that. So... It no longer is something that was said 2,000 years ago. No longer something that you hear about in church on Sunday. It's your life. And as you go into the scripture with that attitude, as you come to these verses, what they're stating, don't, don't listen like you're listening to a pop singer. Don't say that was a jolly good read or that was a mighty good sermon. No. The Word of God is not entertainment. The Word of God is life. And as I remember it and not forget it, then it takes on my flesh and blood in a very real sense. It takes, what can I say? It's incarnate. I hesitate to use that word. I'm not saying in the same sense as the incarnation. But the Word of God gets inside my me, inside my body my actions, my gets inside my head. So in that sense, when I begin to think those nonsensical anxiety thoughts, the Word of God is there and reminds me that to be there is inconsistent with who you are, you see. And so, bless the Lord. That's where we began. Give praise to God, but not empty praise, praise that's joined to an act of remembering, not forgetting, so that you are giving praise to God who is now at work in your life. Well, I...
pray that this will yeah, be a transforming hour that we've spent together. And so I'm going to open it for questions in um, just a moment, or sharing, not necessarily questions. But um, as we do that, um, let, let me say this one more time, um, that let your questions be about what we're talking about, or pretty close to it. And understand that it is impossible to answer great big questions with a yes and no answer. Um, you know, I had someone the other day, well, I've had it all my life, but I'm just thinking of this one, who said, so what do you believe about the second coming? Huh. Like, I can answer that in two minutes. Uh, that's what I mean. There, there are some questions that would take an entire seminar to answer. And so let's keep to what we're talking about. And it can be questions or it can be sharing. And let's see. Okay, Mark. Bless the Lord, you silly self. You've got the best daddy ever. Thanks for reminding us what we got ourselves into. Yes, amen. Valerie, thank you. Need to be reminded of this truth. I do, Valerie. Every day of my life I need to. I think it's, it's a problem that we who make our life, we're, we're life students of the scripture and we are sharing it with others. It, it's, it's one of the temptations that come with the territory that, what can I say, we become professional and we just pass on the Word of God and we, we move in for ourselves, we move into the forget mode. We're talking truth and we're passing truth on, but we fail to remember and that's a very dangerous place to be in. And so, yeah, I need to be reminded. Thank you. Um, yeah blessed to hear that you can pause on one scripture for weeks. I need to learn that. Yeah, you see, when I was a young Christian and being raised in that environment that I was in, it, it was the thing, you know, how many could read through the Bible in six weeks, six months, a year. And I say, that, that can be good. It gives you a good view of the whole scripture. But, uh, and we, in, in the element, the atmosphere that I was raised in, then you sort of got your religious star. You had read through the whole Bible in a few weeks. Um, no, I, I have learned over the years that to read a scripture, to have the Holy Spirit open your eyes to it. And I, I personally carry my little book and write down every word as I, I listen. What are you saying here? And sometimes one word will leap out and you wrestle with that. But it's always with the intent that you're going to put this into practice. And so, yeah, be in no hurry. Just listen to him, Russman. So can we command our emotions not to be prepared, depressed, like shape up our emotions? Yes, I think that's what David is doing here. Um, in other places, he speaks to himself, Awake my glory, which shall wake my inner self, and praise the Lord. I think sometimes if we have um, more than a passing depression, um, maybe we need some help from those who are able to do this to find out the roots of that depression. And maybe we need that, uh, what is commonly known as inner healing, letting Jesus go deep into the roots of who we are and why we behave as we do. Um, but there are days when we just feel out of sorts, we feel that sort of darkness going through, and, and that's a time to stamp your foot and to say, don't you remember who you are, that Christ is your life? And I will praise him. And I would say that um, 
That can also help persons who have deeper issues of depression to turn their whole dark selves to the Lord and praise Him against all uh, feeling and emotion. And I, I have had cause to do that. Over the years, there have been times when I have prefaced my praise. I remember that. Some of them I could take you to the very place where I did it. Where feeling utter despair and a yawning abyss before me with no hope. And I have said against all logic, against all common sense, against everything my eyes see and my ears hear, I now choose to declare, O oh Lord, you are love and you care for me, and so on, to praise him. And to have come from that with a lifted soul and the darkness dispelled in light. And so, yes, I do, I do believe that very definitely. Um, huh, Bob from India, what about God's actions like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? What does that say about God? I've been told this often when I talk about the love of God. You know, one of these days, um, we, we've got to have an hour or two together on the wrath of God. Let, let me say, <laughs> that, that sounds fun, doesn't it? Um, let me say this, God is, heavy on that word, is love. Which means that everything else that we know about God must be passed through His love. The wrath of God is not sort of the dark side of God. It isn't that His face is smiling, His love, and then He gets upset and there's another side to God and He's mad at you. No, 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 a million trillion times no. God is love and James um, says with whom there is no shadow of turning the father is love and cannot be anything but love and the son is love the voice the word of the heart of God spoken out love and the Holy Spirit is love God is love so when we speak of the love of God Sometimes that love comes on negatively because of the condition that it's speaking to. And some of you have heard me talk about this before. Forgive me, but that's a valid question that Bob us. So you see, um, and, and the, the illustration that has really gotten many people, I was in Africa and I was preaching in the church on a Sunday morning with the missionary and then after church we went back to his house which was on the edge of the jungle quite a walk away and, and his little uh, two or three year old um, had gone ahead of us with a eight year old sister and, and anyway as we came close to the house around the bend we heard the little girl um, little three or four year old and she was saying pretty worm pretty worm and, and as we came around the corner, she with a stick was playing with a green mamba, uh, with deadliest snake in Africa, and, and it was ready to strike. And the, the missionary went ballistic. He moved forward at the speed of light, picked up the little girl and actually threw her aside and took out a gun all in that moment and shot the snake. The little girl was crying. I mean, it looked like a rage, a anger. The fact is, that was love, love in rage, saying, I will not let my f little girl die at a snake bite. I'll kill the snake. And the wrath of God that is revealed in Scripture is to save, A, the human race, and B, to save the people who at that time were carrying Jesus in the womb of the nation and every demonic inspired nation around them was trying to destroy them because he was in their womb. Now that's a very shorthand answer. In the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, without going into a detail that would take up the rest of um, the night, but their 
religion and their mindset involved such sexual sin that it uh, deeply affected their bodies with disease and they were on the main route from Europe coming down through Syria from China the Silk Road coming down and entering Israel at the top the same as a European coming up from the Africas and all these caravans of traders moved through Canaan and Sodom and Gomorrah were major cities and for the world and because the world was much smaller in population in those days than it is today and so those caravans going through the cities of Canaan um, would pick up the disease and it wouldn't take very long before the whole world was infected and and, um, and so finally there, there comes a point that God says for, for my love for the world I have to remove this the same way as when I had cancer on my back I loved my body so much I was so good to my body I had to remove that which was intent upon eating the rest of my body um, that's not an answer that's a comment but I hope that it speaks a little bit to it Bob and I'll try and find a way of taking more time on that at some time in the future okay I want to forget the damage that I received having been in a legalistic cult for over 20 years. I've been a victim of bad theology, bad scriptural interpretation, lies about the end time. And so have so many. And this um, webinar we have together has been a means of bringing healing to those who come week after week. How can you forget the bad experiences? by giving praise to God that he has led you through that poisonous swamp into the truth as it is in Jesus. Did you hear me? You forget by no longer connecting to that past by doing it in mind and action. And so if I go over it and over it in my mind and saying I was a victim of that theology, I was a victim of their bad interpretation, then you are still connecting. You're doing it in your mind, even though now it's negative, but you're, you're doing it. So how do you get rid of the experience? by recognizing, and I say it very, very strongly, by recognizing that a Holy Spirit had a hold on you through the whole thing, leading you out of it, in whichever way you came out and whatever you saw that made you break with it, that was the Holy Spirit. Maybe before you knew there was such a personal relationship to Him, but He brought you out, then you will forget in the sense I'm saying it, you'll know it happened, but it no longer has any effect. You will give praise to God that he has now led you to the truth as it is in Jesus. And secondly, you will forget it by deliberately, and I'll say monumentally in the sense of making a marker in your life, of forgiving those who led you in that cult. Forgive them. Forgive them for bad theology. Forgive them for their interpretations. Forgive them for their lies. Forgive them for their oppression, whatever else. And as I've said more than once on this broadcast in the past, forgiveness simply means I name the persons and I name whatever hurt it was they did to me and I release them to the Lord and I do it with words and, and I mean that's a matter I I might have to say I, I, I release John for and I name what he did and I release him to the Lord Father he's in your hands I've put him in your hands for you to do with him whatever your love plans 
He's out of my head. He's out of my hands. And whenever he comes up again, you declare, I have forgiven him. I have released him into the hands of the Father. Those two things. You give praise to God, remembering risen Lord Jesus through the Holy Spirit. He's now got a hold of you, and he's now building truth into you. And secondly, but really uh, the, these two work together, you release them. And of course the word release is the better meaning of the word forgive in Scripture. And that, to me there's nothing, that is the most releasing word in Scripture. When you release someone, I don't care what they've done, I don't care how bad it is, release them to the Lord. Let Him be their judge. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And he's the only one I can trust with that. I don't trust myself. But I can trust him. And as I forgive them, release them to him, and move in this new pathway of truth as it is in Jesus, you will forget. That is, you'll know it happened, but it has no effect on your life today. You will be remembering the truth as it is in Jesus. I hope that helps. Um, so Mark, it seems like as long as we keep the fire of the relationship fueled, it's harder to forget. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. You, you drag it out of the past and you relive it as the victim, you relive it as the abused, the hurt one, and, and you fuel it by present thoughts of bitterness and hurt and whining, complaining, and you fuel it until it becomes a fire as if it just happened and in, in fact it happened six weeks ago or so much longer yeah it's a matter of fueling rather let the holy spirit be the fuel by recognizing everything i just said to turn us all and recognizing the holy spirit is your fuel he's the one who ignites the fire of god in you Hey, Brenda, as we forget not the promises by acting as if they're true because they are, the Holy Spirit will make the things a reality in our lives. Exactly. That's what Joshua chapter 1, those verses I read there, he said, be strong and courageous to do. And he says, as you do, so then you shall be prosperous and successful. That is prosperous in all of life and successful in being alive. So, yeah, that's exactly right, Brenda. Um, okay, let's see. I've had migraines for years, have a hard time believing um, with healing, but the Lord has healed instantly in the past. I need to bring the remembering into the now so that I can believe. That's part of it. We never got to it. Um, David is saying, um, forget not all his benefits. We took a long time on that text, on forget not. But he says, forget not all his benefits. That includes... Of course, everything I said, which is his act in Christ and all his promises, but it also, his benefits, that is your track record with him. It, all of us would do good to remember, go back through your life, and in the sense I've used tonight, remember all the goodness of God, all that old poem song count your blessings count them one by one that's based on this song and i call it track record he did this you see the good idea if when he does things in your life when there's actions of god in your life write them down and bring them into the present. He who blessed you there he who healed you there he who gave you the assurance there He's here. He's now. I remember it into the presence. Okay. I find that when I praise God for his blessing, my spirit is lifted because I know who is in charge. His timing is perfect. Amen. Amen. Tony Z. Yeah, it is finished. It is finished. Mark. Amen. Complete, done, finished. Amen. Forgiveness gives those who forgive freedom to praise God because we can move on and enjoy His blessings. Amen. 
Woods him on. I struggle to leave the care of my grown kids on the Lord. Dear Woodsy Mom, I know you do. I know you do and we pray for you. Will that get easier as I keep putting into practice casting them on the Lord? I need to put that scripture into practice. Yes. As I said, we take our little steps and then we find the strength. Um, put them into his hands with finality. See, you put somebody, your children, into his hands and then we look at what they're doing or not doing and we, we collapse and so then we put them in his hands again. The truth is you put him, them in his, they are in his hands, period. And when you look at what they're doing or not doing, that is the time to give praise to God by declaring that on such and such a date I put whatever their name is into his hands and there they are regardless of what I see. Can you remember that? <laughs> remember that? It's not a matter of day after day going through the same old thing and putting them in his hands. It's doing it, or as I said to someone a minute ago, monumentally. This is it. I put them in his hands. And now, whenever I have reason to, to feel those old waves of fear, anxiety, concern, I stop and I say that three hours ago, three weeks ago, on such and such a day, at such and such a time, I placed my children, whoever, in his hands. And I declared that is so today. And he is working in their lives to will and to do of his good pleasure. Please do that, would you, Mum? You would have a lot more peace. A lot more peace. Amen. Colony. Making the sign of the cross. Isn't that an act of remembrance? Yeah, it is. That causes all magic to cease and demons to tremble. Amen. And for some of you that might be outside of your um, understanding, um, the sign of the cross that Andrew is talking about is in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I know that many evangelicals have already fainted seeing me do that. Um, I do it quite often. Um, I, I, the use of the hands and the body is, is universal in the scripture. So the clapping of hands, the raising of hands, even the dancing of the feet, the leaping in the air for joy, all of that is in, in the scripture. And so to use our hands in order to declare the finished work of Jesus Christ and that I am one with that work and that work is now through the Holy Spirit at work in me in the name of the Father Holy Trinity and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit yeah um, that is to remember into this moment in a physical way which overcomes all my mental chaos it is to bring into this moment all that Jesus is and all that the Holy Trinity is revealed in Jesus. And I might say that baptism is an act of remembrance. So that Paul says in Romans 6, when you were baptized, don't you know that you were died with Christ, buried with Christ, risen with Christ? That is, I recognized his death, his very life and his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension. I was in him. And so faith does something physical. And I, I enter into that death where in fact the Holy Spirit puts me. And I do so through baptism. And um, so that's an act of remembrance that the cross and resurrection of Jesus is not buried in history but is now actualized in my life. And of course the Holy Communion, the Eucharist, is the ultimate act of remembrance in that in the eating of the body of Christ, the drinking of his blood, I am, 
have won. And, and, and in that moment, the, the fullness of Him, we, we participate in Him. And so, yeah, this, this word has great, um, it expands into so much of what we, what we do. And um, I don't know how all of you have taken what I've just said, but yes, Andrew, that is totally correct. Um, Joyflower, welcome Joyflower. I saw that this is your first time. May you come back many times. And, and may the Holy Spirit touch your heart. Okay, and you are ready for Him, and this is your first time too, I believe. And so, welcome. After reading, we just had to tune to the webinar. Thank you for the love of God you share. Please come back, both of you. Um, it, it, you get into the flow and, and you, you realize what the Holy Spirit is doing in you. Okay. Um, and then, thanks for tonight. Um, it helps me sometimes to remember that the very same God that led Paul through his journeys is the one I'm asking to get me through my work day. Now that's experience worth trusting. That's exactly what I'm saying. I can read how he led persons in the scripture and it's nice history. But to realize I am reading of the person who is now in my life. And what I'm reading is now the very sustenance and nourishment of my life so that what I read in Paul becomes my track record of who he is. Um, Sooner too, for a man who has been a part of the decision of abortion 25 years ago, I know I am forgiven but so hard to forget. But forgetting, as you said, is disconnecting, not amnesia. Thank you for your words. Yes, yes. I, I, I trust you, you can apply everything that I said earlier um, in, in answer to stuff to that. Because, number one, God has forgiven you. That is to, to take what I've said now put it into God words in Jeremiah chapter 31 speaking of the days in which we live today he said your sins and your iniquities I will remember no more now that opens up a can of glory remember no more that is he is saying yes it happened but I will never bring it into the present it happened, it's gone, it's over. I will never bring it into my remembrance or into um, the present moment. It's gone, gone. And, and therefore, He has forgiven you. And you simply recognize that forgiveness. And to put it this way, there's a place for confession. Actually, that's another remembrance when with someone that you trust you have to really trust them um, that and better it be someone who understands these things and, and understands that this is a moment of remembrance or sacrament where you spill your guts to God in their presence and they assure you of his forgiveness. And if you can take it from me, I tell you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And you can go on your way rejoicing. It happened. But God has said, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has said, he will remember it no more. And I am taking his words and I'm applying them to you now tonight that you are forgiven. I bless you. Okay. Um, well, 
I've got to come to a close. We're heading on 30 minutes and that's about it. And so I trust you go on your way blessed and that I will give you now. The God who is love, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you, grant you the light and the glory of His presence to fill your lives and your homes, to lead you through this incoming week, and to fill your days with His strength, to uphold you in His love, and to open doors whereby out of you shall flow rivers of life to others. So I bless you, and so I declare, this is the way it is. Amen. Next week, at the same time, we shall be together in the love of God.